Hey y'all, I'm back and I have more creepy stories for you guys. I was trying to think of a topic for today's video and I stumbled across this. This just seems absolutely insane. It says, every day people are sharing their shocking run-ins with real life serial killers. I've done this before. I've read stories of like close encounters with serial killers, whatever. I started reading these. Oh my God. Honestly, let's just hop right in. Number one, my husband was a Chicago cop. While sitting with other cops in a restaurant, a guy walked over and handed out cards saying he was a clown and did lots of kids' parties. My husband thought he was creepy and threw the card away without thinking much about it. A few months later, I ended up in the hospital and my roommate there was the mother of one of John Wayne Gacy's victims. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown. We learned he lived only two blocks from our house. We were there when they dug up his basement and found the rest of the bodies of those poor boys he had killed. It was heartbreaking. You guys. Obviously, people are going to encounter serial killers or people who are like infamous for certain things without experiencing those certain things. And it's just crazy to me. I don't know why. It's like hard to like fathom that. But number two, Roger Kidd, California's I-5 killer, was a weekend skydiver who jumped with us during the day but never stayed at the drop zone for our Saturday night barbecues. As we learned later, would head off for the highways of the Central Valley to pick up hitchhikers and strangle them. When he was finally apprehended in the early 90s, I got a call from the distraught wife of a customer of mine who worked with Roger in the evenings restoring the interiors of vintage cars. She could not believe that she had been that close to a psychopath who was believed to have murdered so many women. That's what I'm saying. It's like, I don't know, like she came in contact with him and like, I don't know. And if it's their MO to kill women, like why not? I don't like, obviously, you know what I mean? Like, obviously I'm so glad it wasn't her, but like, what the hell? Like how do people just have like normal interactions with these people? I don't get it. My aunt went to FSU when Ted Bundy attacked and killed the girls in the sorority house. She knew the girls who died, I believe. She lived in another sorority house just a few doors down from the one that he went into. After the attacks, the police sealed off the entire area and were looking for evidence of him breaking in anywhere else or any evidence at all to add more charges and whatnot. He had escaped prison prior to this, so they had his prints and everything. On the door of my aunt's sorority house, they found his fingerprints on the doorknob and his handprint on the door, which means he probably went to her house first, found the door was locked, pushed off the door, and then went to the other house that he got into. She said they didn't always lock their door so residents could come home late, and they just happened to that night. That decision saved their lives. The door to the house he did get into wasn't locked, so he went in and started his vicious assaults. But my aunt's was, so she lived to see another day. Always lock your doors, people. You don't know who could be outside. No, that's so true. And this next one's about Ted Bundy too. Ted Bundy killed my mother's best friend from high school. Her name was Denise Nasland. I'm so sorry if I'm saying that wrong. My uncle was questioned at the time the police were looking for Bundy because he was also tall, had wavy hair, drove a tan VW bug, and went to the University of Washington. That's insane. And like so scary to be your uncle. Like I would be like, oh my God, I know that there's so many similarities, but it's not me. I moved to Chicago a few months after Jeffrey Dahmer was caught. The next summer, I started dating a guy in Milwaukee. I didn't know a lot about Dahmer because I was newly out and fresh home from Desert Storm. My boyfriend was telling me about him. He said he thought he encountered Dahmer one night at a party as a younger guy had come up to him and his friends asking them to pretend like they knew him because some creepy white guy wouldn't leave him alone. He always thought it was Dahmer. Then they were looking through photos from a party at the bar that summer and Dahmer was in the photos clear as day. They like saved his life. They actually just saved his fucking life. When I was 14 years old, 1991, my family moved across town. A coworker of my father's, who I had known since I was little, Dan, was helping us move. He brought along his childhood friend, John, from Quincy, Illinois, to give us a hand, too. John's brother, Mike, was in town to visit his family, but didn't want to come help out, thankfully. I remember my mom telling me to stay close by my dad because something about John creeped her out. For example, John didn't use deodorant because he was convinced that the aluminum sulfates in it would allow the government to track you. He was weird, but harmless. As the day went on, John mentioned to my dad that his brother was getting his life back on track after the incident. So he changed his name to get a fresh start. I had no clue what they were talking about, so I ignored it. Fast forward to 1997. My dad's friend Dan called my dad and told him to turn on the news. There on the screen was John being interviewed about the arrest of his brother. John's brother was Michael Swango, the so-called nurse of death who poisoned and killed anywhere between 10 to 60 people while working as a nurse. The incident his brother spoke of was him receiving five years in prison for poisoning his coworkers, almost killing them. Are you, like, you're, what the fuck? Number seven, I briefly worked at a bakery right down the street from the St. Lucie County Courthouse in Fort Pierce, Florida in 2012. Omar Maytine, the 2016 Orlando nightclub shooter, 
worked at said courthouse as a security guard and would frequently come in with another security guard, Torres, who I had a slight thing for to order coffee, a fruit, and vanilla yogurt parfait. He was always very quiet and polite. I only lived in Orlando for about five months in 2012, but I went to high school with a lot of people who would go to the clubs in Orlando. Although I was no longer in there during 2016, the day of the shooting, I kept getting alerts from Facebook that friends were checking in to confirm that they were safe. After probably the 10th notification, I finally reached out to one of the friends who was still living in Orlando and asked them what was going on and why my phone was blowing up. They immediately sent me a link to a live news report covering the shooting and the subsequent standoff with police in which Omar was eventually killed. I was floored, but thankfully no one I knew was killed or injured during the shooting. Things of this nature are just reminders that you never truly know what people are capable of. Oh my god. No, because it's so true. I just feel like, I don't know, anyone could do anything at any time. And I can't handle that fact. I used to work at a private cigar lounge in New York City in my early 20s. This was a members only club, so we had very high profile men coming in. There were some regulars who were cool, nice people. One member in particular usually brought in his friend who was a bigger man with glasses. He was an architect and an avid hunter. When he came in, he would talk about his African safari trips and he would show me pictures of all the wild animals he hunted. I wasn't exactly impressed because there were lions and zebras, but of course I had to listen and be engaged. He came in at least two or three times a month with his friend and I usually chatted with him when he did. Fast forward about eight years and I find out he's being charged with the Gilgo Beach serial killings. They found the first body in 2010 when I first moved to New York City, and I continued to follow the case along for years. I never would have thought I would have encountered the actual Long Island serial killer, not just once, but numerous times for a year. Where do you go from that? Like, what do you do after that? What do you do after you learn that information? My uncle was transferred to the submarine base in Washington in the early 80s. My aunt got a job in the paint department at the Kenworth factory. She said that she spoke daily to a truck painter when he would come in to get his paint. He was quiet and nice, but she couldn't shake the nagging feeling that he was off. She was creeped out by him and she told my uncle about it. My uncle told her if she was uncomfortable, then she should quit. She did and thought nothing of it for 16 years. Then one day when she was watching the news, there was a story on the arrest of the Green River Killer. She froze when the picture of Gary Ridgway came across the screen. She was looking at the man who creeped her out in the paint shop many years ago, and it still creeps her out to this day. You know, that's what, like, I would never, and I would never forget about it. I would, that would never leave my mind. It would haunt me for the rest of my life. A roommate I lived with in my 20s grew up next door to Gary Ridgway, AKA the Green River Killer, and as a kid used to play with his son. My ex-husband worked with him at Kenworth. Wait, shit, what the hell? Gary's nickname was Green River Gary there because in the early 80s, he was questioned and his house was searched. When I was a cashier in a hardware store not far from where he lived before he was caught, he came through my line many times. Oh my god, that's insane because they're like so similar, like those two people experience the same thing. Number 11, a couple of years ago, I was riding my bike for a food delivery service in downtown Chicago. I stopped at a 7-Eleven for a soda and a cigarette. While I was smoking, a guy and a girl walked up. The girl went inside and the young dude, with tattoos all up his arm and neck, he was a scrawny little white dude so they stood out, came up and started asking me about the area. He asked if I worked in the neighborhood, if it was busy, if people were nice, if I liked it, etc. I asked about his tattoos, he said he was a rapper on Instagram, and that I would hear him out. Turns out he was Bobby Cremo, who murdered all of those people in Highland Park a year later. I think he was actually scouting downtown Chicago when I met him, and then I maybe talked him out of it. Like, talked him out of it that day. Like, you talked... No, I just like also wouldn't even be able to handle that info. I just can't handle any of this. My dad went to school with Michael Ross, a small town Connecticut serial killer. When I was an infant, Michael held me. Shortly after that, it came out he was being convicted of several murders, including two girls that attended the same church as my parents. Those girls were picked up by him just off the highway in front of my parents' house. Never been more creeped out by anything that I don't even remember. I would, I, like, I would wash my body every, like, every two seconds, I'd be like, he touched me. My old neighbor is the wife of a serial killer who stalked sex workers. I remember meeting her family when we moved in. Only a few months prior, I had done a report on this serial killer for class. She said her name while introducing herself, and I was like, no shit, I just did a report on, insert husband's name, for my criminal justice course. Talk about an awkward introduction. No, because I would do the same thing, so I get it. I'm not sure how many are in here, but I, I think we have a couple more. I was walking home alone the night Son of Sam was caught. A car slowed down across the street from me. I got bad vibes and was thinking of going to ring the doorbell of someone nearby's house when suddenly a car full of young people drove up beside us. They yelled out, stop following her, leave her alone, and thank God it made the car take off. I love them. I'm sure those people saved my life from Son of Sam that night. I was not far from where he was caught, and that car that followed me was the same car that he had. 
oh my god they actually saved your life that's that's oh my god okay yeah the last one and finally in law school i worked with my school's innocence project one of the cases I was assigned to was that of a young man who had been convicted of the murder of a teenage runaway. My partner on the case and I were pretty convinced he was innocent. He never confessed, had an alibi, no criminal record, and the people implicating him were trying to avoid prison sentences of their own. But we needed DNA evidence to exonerate him. We knew his DNA did not match the DNA found on the victim, but since the state had dropped the sexual assault charge, we couldn't prove he hadn't murdered her after she had been assaulted. Wild, I know. We interviewed as many witnesses as we could and obtained DNA samples from those who would willingly provide them. One of the witnesses we had talked to, Walter, was one of the last people to see the victim alive. We spoke to him at length on the phone and he seemed genuinely interested in trying to find out what happened to the girl, but he would not provide us with a DNA sample. So the case went quiet for a couple years. Then the DNA database found a match for the DNA found on the girl. A man named Walter Ellis had been arrested for essaying and murdering seven women in the Milwaukee area. This was the same man we had spoken with about the young woman's murder. The police had interviewed him after the murder and had cleared him of any wrongdoing. Instead, an innocent man was convicted of the murder that Ellis had committed. After this murder, he went on to commit three more. He was responsible for 10 total murders in Milwaukee, charged with seven. Three different men were charged with the remaining three murders, with two of those men being wrongfully convicted. Like, in the justice system? Like, is it justice? I'm just wondering. Like, what the hell are we doing? What the hell are we doing? Cops are dumb. I'm so sorry. They're so fucking dumb. Yeah, this guy seems great. He was the last person to see her alive, but he said he didn't do it, so, and he's not giving us a DNA sample, which isn't sketchy at all, so we're just gonna free him, but you... Your DNA doesn't match. I think it was you. Are you kidding? Well, that's all I have for now. I hope you enjoyed. I don't know. I low-key kind of hate this kind of stuff because it really freaks me out. It makes me think about like all the people in my life and I'm like, who, who's it going to be? But if for some reason you have any stories like this, like if you've ever encountered a serial killer, anything like that, and you want to share with me or the community, I'll have my subreddit down below. You can share any stories. Let's not meet like stalker stories, paranormal, all that jazz. I know I said that I was going to keep rambling at the end of my videos, but I have filmed three days in a row. I have absolutely nothing left to say. Day. I'm pre-recording for a trip that I have um, this coming weekend so that I will have two videos next week because I get back in the middle of the next week so I just want to like get ahead so I've been feeling a lot and I have nothing to say I'm so sorry and Nara's here Nara's here to say hello so I'm just gonna go but I love you guys I will see you in the next one bye